Okay, um, please welcome um, Kavina Mercer, who is an independent scholar based in the UK. Um, he writes and teaches on visual arts in the black diaspora. He was a reader in art history and diaspora studies at Middlesex University in London, um, and has taught at Princeton University, New York University, University of California in Santa Cruz, and University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Mercer has received fellowships from Cornell University and the New School University in New York, and is an inaugural recipient of the 2006 Clark Prize for Excellence in Arts, Art Writing, awarded by the um, Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute in Massachusetts. Born in London, he was educated in Ghana and England and graduated with a BA in Fine Arts from St. Martin's School of Art in London in 1981, before obtaining a PhD in Sociology at Goldsmiths College, University of London in 1990. His first book, Welcome to the Jungle, in 1994, uh, published in 1994, opened new lines of inquiry in art, film, and photography, and his writings feature uh, are featured in several landmark anthologies, including Cultural Studies, 1992, Art in Its Histories, 1998, The Visual Cultural Reader, 2001, and Theorizing Diaspora, 2003. His monographs include studies of James Van Dersey, Andrian Piper, Isaac Julian, Keith Piper, and Rotimi Fanny Coyote. Coyote, is that how you pronounce it? Um, he is a, a serious editor, um, of um, Annotating Art Histories, co-published by MIT and INIVA, um, whose titles include Cosmopolitan Modernisms, 2005, Discrepant Abstraction, 2006, Pop Art in Vernacular Cultures, in 2007, and Exiles, Diasporas, and Strangers, in 2008. His forthcoming publications include Postcolonial Grotesque, Jane Alexander's Poetic Monsters, and Art History After Globalization, Formations of the Colonial Modern. Please uh, join me in welcoming Kapina Mercer to the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I'd like to say that this is uh, not only an honor to be invited to present this year's Elaine Locke lectures, it's also a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon and for the next couple of days. Uh, it's really quite heartwarming to see old friends once again. And I think in such a convivial atmosphere, I'm looking forward to making new friends too. Just a couple of words by way of an introduction to the topic um, that I'll be addressing over the um, the next couple of days as well as today. Uh, the year before last, I finished the four volumes in the Annotating Arts History series that was just mentioned. Uh, this was something that I conceived as the series editor. And the premise was very simple. Let's take another look at 20th century art, this time from a cross-cultural perspective. So having covered the 20th century, uh, both thematically and chronologically, uh, I faced a choice. There are only really two directions in which to go. Uh, there are a great number of controversies in contemporary art that I think still attract one's attention. But I have to say that more and more my curiosity was drawn towards the 19th century. Um, so this is new territory for me in many respects. And in that spirit, I'm very much looking forward to your responses, your questions and comments, uh, as well as our conversations on a one-to-one -one basis during the reception. Okay, so on 30th May, 1861, Robert Scott Duncanson hired Pike Opera House in Cincinnati as the first stop in an international touring exhibition of two large-scale pictures, The Land of the Lotus Eaters and Western Tornado. Announcing his itinerary to the Daily Cincinnati Gazette, who reported that Lotus Eaters would be on display for just one week, after which it would be taken to Canada, Duncan received such a claim that the exhibition was extended for over a month. And during this time, another local journalist enthused, it has been the steady determination of the artist, Mr. Duncanson, to take it to Europe at an early day, where to, we are safe in prognosticating, it will remain, 
for the wealthy connoisseurs of that hemisphere will not suffer such a gem of art to recross the Atlantic. After traveling to Toronto in November 1861, Duncanson then arrived in Montreal in September 1863, where he resided for two years before reaching his goal in 1865. Setting sail from Canada, he exhibited lotus eaters, first of all in Dublin and then in Glasgow, before traveling to London in 1866, where he stayed for a year before returning to Cincinnati and setting up a new studio on 4th Street. Now, in making this journey, Duncanson shared company with other 19th century African American artists who also undertook such voyages. In 1865, Mary Edmona Lewis departed from Boston to Rome, making frequent return visits from Italy to the United States. Henry Asawa Tanner chose to settle permanently in Paris, and he lived in France as an expatriate from 1894 to 1937. Now, once viewed through the conceptual lens of diaspora, these black Atlantic crossings are important because they give us a fresh interpretative context for a deeper understanding of the artistic choices made by the first generation of African-American painters and sculptors. There's also another feature that the three artists share in common. The artistic genre that each one opted to work within all reflected the prevailing visual languages of their times from Duncanson's romantic landscapes and Lewis's neoclassical sculpture to Tanner's painterly realism. But what stands out as the core issue in need of art historical explanation is the scarcity of black imagery within their work as a whole. Now, previous studies tend to interpret both patterns in largely negative terms. Correlating the two, Samella Lewis took the view that, quote, the flight from racial prejudice also included a complete avoidance of racial subject matter in their work, end quote. And this implies that outbound migration to Europe and the paucity of black content indicated a conformist or assimilative quest to gain acceptance from the art establishment. Whereas I want to suggest that an alternative account comes into view once we give closer attention to the two key issues of iconography and context. Once we begin to notice how each artist introduces subtle changes of tone and accent into the visual languages in which they came to voice, we observe that all three produced artistic utterances that speak to 19th century discourses on race in an indirect or elusive manner, often <coughs> operating at a subtextual level of allegory. Duncanson's literary source for the Lotus Eaters, for example, was a poem by Lord Alfred Tennyson, that took on particular resonance during the Civil War years. The biblical stories that Lewis chose in Hager, or that Tanner selected for his rendition of Daniel in the Lion's Den, point to a hidden or encrypted commentary on black life in a segregated society, rather than the intentional avoidance of political realities. So I want to suggest that these signifying practices of semantic indirection warrant our attention not only because they sharpen the question of artistic intentionality and how we interpret it, but also because they deepen our understanding of historical inauguration. That is to say, how a distinct tradition comes into being and adds a difference to the symbolic universe in which it is produced. Secondly, once we consider the overall context in which black artists made their choices, the issue of structure and agency that's implied by the notion of artistic will, that's to say the Kunstwollen, or the will to form, takes on heightened complexity in light of the social relations of race and representation. Whereas earlier studies saw the lack of black content in largely biographical or psychological terms, I argue for the advantage of approaching context structurally. As well as their training and education, the patrons who commissioned their work and the collectors who preserved it, a structural understanding of context would also include those representations of blackness that were produced by the dominant image of the Negro in different 19th century periods. Hence, in addition to social disparities among the choices available to white and black artists, there is a structural dimension to the, differenti the differential context of race and representation. 
Let me put this in another way. <clears throat> At the very moment when art starts to become modern in the 19th century, as Western artists enjoy freedom of choice over the subject matter and style of their work that liberated them from dependence on their patrons and made them agents of artistic autonomy, we find that black artists instead um, found themselves in a condition of symbolic heteronomy. Being answerable to the external demands imposed by others was apparent not just for Lewis and Duncanson in terms of their relationship with abolitionist patrons, but also extended to the marketplace in terms of the pressures of customer demand expressed on the part of the demographic majority. In short, we might say that the conditions of diasporic life after slavery entailed structural contexts where absolute freedom of choice was simply not available as a historic possibility. So what makes their art black, then, is not just the artist's ethnic origin, nor manifest signs of race at the level of content, but also the agency of diacritical choices that are made under determinate conditions of relative unfreedom. Now, in 1940, in his book, The Negro in Art, which I'll return to in the third lecture, Elaine Locke pinpointed these structural aspects of art's context in his insight that, quote, it has taken three or four generations to break these taboos of race disparagement, which, even more than limited opportunity, have held the Negro artist back. Then, too, our pioneer artists could succeed only as exceptional individuals, detached from the group, and as a result, they eschewed the Negro subject. In most instances, also, their only chance, either for training or for extensive recognition, was to go abroad." End quote. For my part, it's at the level of methodology that these lectures seek to meld the semiotic tools uh, that Mikhail Bakhtin put forward in his notion of the dialogic imagination, with Paul Gilroy's conception of the diaspora as an experience of modernity that questions the territorial claims of the nation state as a primary basis of collective belonging. Among the millions who survived the Middle Passage, the multitudes who once identified themselves variously as Akan, Yoruba, Mende, or Bakongo, for instance, had absolutely no choice as to whether they would end up speaking English, French, Portuguese, or Dutch as a result of their enslavement. But in the process of becoming Negro, and then colored, and then black, these ex-African subjects did something with the language of their masters. They seized opportunities for self-fashioning through acts of appropriation that introduced ambiguity and doubleness into the cultural signifiers of blackness. The painting and sculpture that we'll be looking at over the next three days is not modernist by any stretch of the imagination, but by tracking aesthetic strategies of double coding that involve what Houston Baker calls the deformation of mastery within the mastery of form, we not only find that Tanner, Lewis, and Duncanson were engaged in critical reflections on the conditions of black life under diasporic modernity, but that the explanatory models generated by dialogical methods um, encompass what is aesthetically distinctive to diaspora cultures in 20th century art as well. And in the frame of this wider picture, to suggest that dialogism precedes modernism is to accept the challenge of those 19th century practices, practices that force us to rethink our understanding of the very moment of Ursprung, that is to say, the primal moment of origination or inauguration that distinguishes the tradition as culturally and politically black. But to begin at the beginning, however, we should notice the double-sided aspects of Duncanson's decision to take the two of his pictures on tour in 1861. Yes, this was undeniably an act of evasion and indeed a life-saving choice that enabled him to avoid the Civil War. But also in the process of seeking out audiences who might readily decode the allegory he had encoded at a subtextual level, the artist was also addressing the very crisis of nationhood that had given rise to the war as a consequence of racial slavery. In order to fully grasp the magnitude of the issues that Duncanson chose to address below the threshold of the visible, we need to consider three questions then. Why did he opt for the landscape genre 
as his medium of choice. What was it that made Cincinnati significant for Duncanson's entry into the fine arts profession? And what do the relations do between black artists and white patrons in this case reveal about the ways in which structural contexts of race may overdetermine the fulfillment of individual intentions? Um, this is a portrait of the artist taken by William Notman during his residence in Montreal in the 1860s. So born into a free colored family in the Michigan town of Monroe in 1821, Duncanson gained access to fine art production through an apprenticeship in the house painting trade that had been established by his father, John Dean Duncanson, the son of a mulatto Virginia slave who had earned his release from bondage. Having set up his own painting and glazing firm at the age of 17, Duncanson then moved from skilled artisanship into the production of easel pictures that were known as fancy pieces. And this happened when he re relocated to Mount Healthy uh, near Cincinnati in 1841. Exhibiting three works in the 1842 exhibition of the Society for the Promotion of Useful Knowledge, and two of these works were copies after popular engravings, and this is the most likely method by which he taught himself. Uh, Duncanson also received favorable notices for paintings that he then displayed at the 1844 Mechanics Institute Fair in Cincinnati. Now the contents, as this early work uh, illustrates, of Duncan's initial portfolio were extremely varied, from still life studies to copies of popular prints. And if this suggests difficulties in finding a foothold in the marketplace, so does his frequent itinerancy between Monroe, Detroit, and Cincinnati. In 1848, a decisive breakthrough came about when Duncanson received a commission to depict the lake, uh, sorry, the cliff mine at Lake Superior, which had generated significant profits for one of its investors, Reverend Charles Avery, a Methodist anti-slavery campaigner. And this is another of the works conducted from direct observation in this period uh, in Lake uh, Superior. It was at this point that Duncanson began to sketch from direct observation. By the time he returned to Lake Superior for subsequent sketching excursions that gave rise to the seasons in 1849, a landscape series that he exhibited at the Western Art Union in Cincinnati in 1850, an audience for the genre had been cultivated in the Midwest by Thomas Wetridge and William Sontag, who are two leading Cincinnati artists who helped to introduce works by Thomas Cole and the Hudson River School in exhibitions they organized in 1845 and 1847. Now, as a border city whose wealth was based on river commerce with southern states, Cincinnati was an important center for the free colored population. As art historian Joseph Kettner notes, quote, Ohio laws provided mulattoes and persons with a fair complexion with the same legal protection accorded whites. Hence, along with an abolitionist presence that was led by campaigning organizations such as the American Anti-Slavery Society, the city's support for landscape artists of the emerging Ohio River Valley School, as well as prominent artists of the day such as Hiram Powers, all, found red all readily found patrons. And this facilitated Duncanson's integration into the profession. By 1840, in fact, Duncanson had a downtown studio that adjoined that of Sontag and was also a member of the Cincinnati Sketch Club. Following his 1852, 1850-52 uh, commission to produce eight murals uh, in the Belmont mansion of Nicholas Longworth, Duncanson was able to finance his first journey to Europe in 1853, when he undertook a grand tour of Italy in Sontag's company. At the Florence studio of Hiram Powers, he presented a letter of introduction that had been written by Nicholas Longworth, who described Duncanson as a man of integrity and gentlemanly deportment, adding, and when you shall see the first landscape he shall paint in Italy, advise me of the name of the artist in Italy that can paint so fine a picture. And his connection with Longworth, who was a wealthy Ohio lawyer turned real estate entrepreneur, who was both an art patron and an abolitionist supporter, 
was highly important. On the one hand, if the Belmont murals highlight Duncanson's mastery of the academic conventions of the French landscape tradition that we associate with Claude Lorraine, for example, the unlikely combination of Ohio landmarks uh, and uh, elements, iconographic elements such as English thatched cottages within the overall decorative scheme point towards the tastes and demands of the patron rather than the intentions of the artist per se. In other words, the intention in a commissioned work such as this is one that stems from the client who pays for it and thus owns for it rather than the artist who, like an artisan, merely carries it out. We will presently see how such heteronomy explains the one moment in Duncanson's oeuvre when race is addressed directly. But on the other hand, if Duncanson's 1858 portrait of Nicholas Longworth is placed alongside his portrayals of other abolitionist patrons who supported his career in Cincinnati, uh, such as Freeman C. Carey in 1855 or Richard Sutton Russ I, who was a senior administrative figure at Wilberforce College in Ohio. This also seems fair to say that certain shortcomings in his handling of the human figure may have also have influenced his decision to specialize in landscapes, where the figure is either absent or present as part of a larger pictorial composition. So in this respect, it's crucial to observe that by the early 1850s, Duncanson had achieved a signature style that was based on the synthesis of two opposing <coughs> tendencies within the landscape genre. One was observational detail based on outdoor sketching in specific geographical locations. The other was a compositional grammar based on codes and convention organized around a literary um, or narrative source. Thomas Cole was a major influence. Just as Sontag had made copies after Cole's Voyage of Life, Duncanson's version of the Garden of Eden of 1852 and his Dream of Arcadia of the same year acknowledged Cole's example and highlighted biblical and literary sources such as Milton that would ennoble the landscape with spiritual and moral authority. Indeed, in his 1841 lecture on American scenery, Cole wanted to fuse his philosophy of nature with the vast and untamed American wilderness on the basis of his view that, quote, poetry and painting sublime and purify thought, and rural nature is full of the same quickening spirit, end quote. And while this outlook expressed a romanticism with which Duncanson aligned himself, he nonetheless parted company from the more patriotic codification of the American landscape as an anchoring point for mid-19th century conceptions of national identity. So in keeping with the compositional grammar that he borrowed from Cole, the diminutive figures that we see in the foreground fishing in Blue Hole Floodwaters Little Miami River of 1851 heighten the dramatic power of their natural surroundings. Duncanson's detailed rendering of boulders, trees, and foliage situates this work very clearly within the picturesque. But unlike the bucolic innocence of the regional genre scenes that were based on his sketching expositions to Lake Superior, there's a subtext to Duncanson's choice of topography that goes against the grain of the underlying equation of nature philosophy and national identity. Within the clandestine geography of the Underground Railroad, through which southern slaves fled north to the Canadian border, it's crucial to know that the confluence of the Ohio and Little, River, sorry, Little Miami rivers was, quote, a favored escape route for fugitive slaves. This is from Bearden and Henderson's um, History of African American Artists. Moreover, as art historian Sharon Patton adds, quote, the tale of the slave, George Washington McQuarrie, who escaped in 1849 and eventually settled in a small community in Miami County, Ohio, was well known among blacks in that region. Patton also points out that Little Miami River is important in early African-American art because it, quote, holds a double-coded meaning, one for whites, another for blacks. But she leaves open the question as to whether we are dealing with doubleness in terms of the encoding of artistic intention or in terms of an act of decoding at the level of reception. 
In relation to Duncanson's later works of the 1860s, she adopts a neutral approach, which holds that, quote, allegory could be interpreted differently according to whether the onlooker took a black or a white viewpoint, end quote. Whereas I would want to characterize the issue in terms of a productive ambiguity that has the ability to generate a surplus of meanings rather than a matter of fixed meanings that can be strictly divided along black and white lines. Furthermore, in view of the indexical status of the specific geographical site that Duncanson chose as his subject in this landscape, the question of intentionality must take priority over that of reception, because what is at stake is the degree of indirection that Duncanson introduced by exercising his artistic freedom of choice. To make the point another way, so as to foreground the contradictory conditions under which race is inscribed in Duncanson's works in different ways at different times. Let us now turn, turn to a work that presents us with even more challenging questions of interpretation, even though it stands entirely separately from his landscapes. I hope you're going to be ready for this. <laughs> Produced just two years later, in 1853, Uncle Tom and Little Eva is the sole work within Duncanson's corpus of over 160 paintings that depicts a black subject. It is doubly anomalous, as much because Duncanson rarely portrayed full-length figures as because of its manifest content. Based on a copy of an illustration from Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery novel of 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the dull and lifeless handling of the scene led the Detroit Free Press at the time to disparage the work as a form of what it called Uncle Tomitude. <laughs> and Patton herself adds that this was a painting that, quote, even Duncanson ridiculed. What matters most about this work, then, is that it indicates how an artist's individual intentions were entirely subordinated to the choices of his abolitionist patron. For the meaning of Uncle Tom and Little Eva can only be attributed to its origins as a commission from the Reverend James Francis Conover, who was an abolitionist campaigner and editor of the Detroit Tribune. Sorry, Tribute. We thus face an especially sharp paradox, because whereas the landscape genre gave Duncanson the freedom of choice that led to ambiguous inscriptions of race in Little Miami River, the subject matter that Conover chose in commissioning a figurative scene rendered Duncanson's artistic agency wholly subservient the, to the paternalistic iconography of black dependency. Indeed, we might say that the power relations of black subservience uh, depicted in Uncle Tom and Little Eva replicated the heteronymous transaction between the artist and patron in this case. Longworth's patronage in the Belmont murals had similarly overridden Duncanson's artistic intentions, and indeed his freedom of choice. But in the absence of the human figure, the work's intended meaning had not been compromised to the degree that it was when Conover chose a subject based on representations of race. So as his career advanced during the 1850s, we need to take account of three factors uh, to understand the maturation of Duncanson's style. Firstly, with regard to issues of patronage and the ownership of intentionality that we've just touched upon, it's significant to note that Duncanson's involvement with photography, even though previous studies tend to regard this as a mere sidebar. In the 1840s, the artist had indeed formed a partnership with a Mr. Coates in Cincinnati uh, in order to present chemical paintings comprising four splendid views after the singular style of de Guerre. And for 25 cents admission, Ohio audiences were entertained by biblical pictures on light, sensitive surfaces that developed before their very eyes. And then a decade later, in the 1850s, this would have been at the same time as Little Miami River, Uncle Tom and Little Eva, Duncanson entered into a collaborative partnership with an African-American photographer, John Presley Ball, that's advertisement you see, who opened Ball's great Dogarian Gallery of the West in 1847 in Cincinnati as both a photographic studio, but also as a gallery 
in which customers could purchase copies of paintings that had popular appeal, and these included Duncanson's landscapes as well. Now, we'll return later on to the entrepreneurial initiative that Ball and Duncanson undertook together in 1855 when they produced a landscape panorama that toured mid Midwestern cities. But for now, the most important aspect I want to put across is to observe in this collaboration between two African-American visual practitioners how the photographic medium offered opportunities for autonomy that was not otherwise available in the fine art medium of oil painting, where, as we've seen, freedom of choice was often controlled by the patron rather than the artist. The second factor in understanding the maturation of Duncanson's style is that as he entered his 40s, the scale of his artistic ambitions were considerably broadened by the confidence with which he returned to the United States from his grand tour of Italy, such that in 1854 he declared, quote, I have made up my mind to paint a great picture, even if I fail. And expressing his intent in letters that he wrote to Junius Sloan, who was a white artist that Duncanson had taken on as an apprentice, during a period when the influence of Sontag on Duncanson's work was at its height, his landscapes of the late 1850s begin to indicate a shift away from the picturesque vocabulary of Thomas Cole that we saw just now as an influence in um, Little Miami River. And as an indication, I'm showing a much later work that was uh, produced from his sketches produced in Italy. This is uh, from the 1860s, from 1864, Recollections of Italy, that would have produced, been produced during his tour of Canada and Britain. Um, but I think is indicative of the move from the picturesque towards the classical or academic Italianate landscape. And this, is, this becomes the medium within which he begins to formulate his intentions for the great picture. Wrestling with the choice of a subject for this great picture, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which had in fact inspired Thomas Cole's last work, The Cross of the World, was initially considered. But as Duncanson's search for a literary source took him further away from the observational sketches that were grounded in the geography of the Midwestern terrain, his output of the later 1850s was dominated by the classical European tradition of the Italianate landscape. Recapitulating on the depictions of Greco-Roman ruins in earlier works, such as Ruins of Carthage and Time's Temple, uh, the key work that he put forward uh, in support of the increasingly, increasingly expansive scale of his ambitions was the Temple of Sybil of 1859, which is not illustrated. His mastery of classicist conventions won considerable acclaim to the extent that Duncanson's composition in this work closely paralleled Sontag's Italian lake with classical ruins uh, of 1858. But by the same token, it was also widely criticized for minor faults by comparison. And as we move towards the 1860s and the context in which Duncanson arrived at the choices whereby Land of the Lotus Eaters would fulfill his intentions to paint a great picture, there is a third factor which illuminates the artist's shifting alignments, namely the emergence of a new approach in American landscape painting that was driven by the high romantic interest in the sublime. Whereas Sontag transposed the conventions of a classical European model to give academic gravitas to the work of the Ohio Valley School, and for his part, Cole wanted to elevate depictions of the American wilderness amongst artists of the Hudson River School by drawing on canonical literary sources, by the mid-1850s, a third strand of approach had emerged, and this was opened up by the American painter Asher Durand. Writing in the crayon in 1855, his outlook gave added intellectual weight to the American landscape genre on the grounds that, quote, the province of painting is not to imitate but to suggest, not to reproduce but to represent to the mind or appeal to the moral faculties. And in proportion, as art tends to be imitative, it is base, though excellent. And as it aspires to, be to the intellectual and thence to the moral, it is noble, end quote. And the aesthetics of the sublime um, that Durand expressed in this way 
encourage precisely the painterly ambition that Frederick Church pursued in epic works such as Heart of the Andes of 1859, a panorama of waterfalls, forest, and tropical flora that made a grandiose bid, quote, to portray the vast extent of the sublime wilderness that Americans assumed was their domain through manifest destiny. And just to underscore the point, you should notice, let me try and point it out, a little cross that declares ownership of the, uh, of the wilderness, as it were. By aiming to ennoble indigenous landscapes, the American sublime not only attracted a burgeoning audience for art, uh, and specifically for art that broke away from European precedents, most notably the Italianate model, but also acquired a political dimension in the period leading up to the Civil War. And as he draws upon successive paradigms in the landscape genre from the Italianate, the picturesque, the pastoral, and the sublime, the poetic double coding in Duncanson's work acquires deeper la layers of complexity. Observing the steps that led him to the textual source that he finally chose as the inspiration for the Lotus Eaters, we also need to see how its different stylistic influences were mediated by an alternative vision of the sublime that broke away from the nationalist codification of the American landscape. Okay, so this, uh, now a more sort of detailed focus on the land of the Lotus Eaters in terms of thinking about it as black allegory in relation to the poetics of the sublime. Turning from Milton to Tennyson's 1832 poem, The Lotus Eaters, the scene that Duncanson composed is based on the narrative episode in which Ulysses and his army arrive in the otherworldly realm um, during their return from the Battle of Troy. Suffused with a quality of sensual luminosity, Land of the Lotus Eaters faithfully adheres to stanzas in the poem in which the poem's protagonists, quote, saw the gleaming river seaward flow, far off three mountain tops, three silent pinnacles of aged snow, stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops, end quote. Isolating the moment when the seafaring Greek soldiers are welcomed into this exotic otherworldly realm by dark-skinned natives bearing gifts of lotus flowers, the clothed Caucasian figures who are grouped at center-right foreground are depicted as the intoxicated recipients of the plant's narcotic power. Whoops. And this is a detail of that uh, section in the lower left foreground. Reclining in serene passivity, their languid postures imply a blissful contentment that makes them reluctant to leave their Arcadian haven, whose seductive power is emphasized as much by the ambiance of the sunset as by the drama of contrasting scale, whereby their minuscule presence is offset by the grandeur of lush foliage, tropical palms, waterfalls, and remote mountains. Begun in December 1860, when the Civil War was imminent, and completed in May 1861, after hostilities commenced, Duncanson's intricate handling of his literary source implots a political allegory beneath the idealized surface of a classical landscape. As Kettner's exegesis reveals, quote, the narcotic-induced apathy of Ulysses' soldiers reflects a contemporary criticism that the South had grown complacent and dependent on slave labor to support its economy and luxurious standard of living, end quote. Looking closer, moreover, we begin to notice how the double coding of such intended meanings generates further layers of allegorical signification once we tease out the cross-cutting relationships between subtext and context in the moment of production. In terms of formal composition, Lotus Eaters retains the classical template of an ideal landscape that's been sectioned into a three-point zigzag pattern that guides the viewer's eye from a foreground incident through mid-range volume and mass towards a rear ground plane that is suffused with light. But in terms of iconography, where the classical European landscape tradition that takes Greco-Roman ruins as its definitive content 
locates the Arcadian realm of utopia in the d far distant past, Duncanson's landscape of utopian serenity evokes peaceful calm on the surface, while the subtextual signified that links this fictive scene to the socio-political context in which the painting was conceived transposes the temporal order of its underlying subtext towards the immediate future. So far from evoking uh, nostalgia for Arcadian innocence, Lotus Eaters encodes a pointed irony for the metonymic implication is that just as Ulysses squandered his victory in Troy by succumbing to the seductive lotus leaf, thus betraying the vulnerability of ancient Greece as an imperial nation, so the United States, having grown complacent from the wealth created by the slaves they owned, like the Greeks, faces a dystopian future in which its very nationhood is threatened by consequences that stemmed from the um, luxurious ind indolence of slavery in the South. On the visible surface, we behold a scene of harmonious coexistence among differently complected figure groups, as well as harmony between nature and man. But beneath this seductive illusion, the allegorical subtext articulates a prophetic forewarning of the cataclysm that is about to engulf the United States as a result of its past dependence on racial slavery. To the extent that this prophetic dimension has been introduced by virtue of Duncanson's switch from past to future tense, as it were, there are two distinct strands of intertextual signification that need to be examined in detail. One concerns the theme of ruins and ruination in Duncanson's transition from the picturesque to the sublime, and the other concerns the diasporic resonance of uh, the Odyssey that lies at the origin of uh, Tennyson's poem itself. So bearing in mind that Lotus Eaters was initially paired on its tour, its exhibition tour in 1861 with Western Tornado, which is now lost of unknown location, it is significant that the destructive power of nature was also evoked in another work of 1861, uh, entitled Prairie Fire, which is also lost on an unknown location. And that a later work um, from 1869, sorry, Waiting for a Shot, shared a similar large-scale format, as well as the thematic focus on the landscape as a, uh, on the landscape as a sublime source of beauty and terror. By virtue of the formal structure in this third work, in which Duncanson devotes vast swathes of canvas to the sky that dominates the low horizon, and whose intense palette, which of course is not apparent in this black and white reproduction, suggests a sunset or sunrise, we can say that the sublime liberated Duncanson from the staid conventions of academic templates, even though there is a consistent thematic continuity with the iconogra iconography of ruins. Previous scenes of cataclysm that were drawn from local observations, such as Western Forest of 1857, showing dead or broken trees, evoke man's destruction of nature during the course of westward progress in the formation of the nation. And indeed, this romantic lament had been prefigured in Thomas Cole's 1825 Landscape with Dead Trees. But as the visual language of the sublime opens up the dense compositional idiom of the picturesque, a dialogical shift takes place whereby man's threat to nature that is then cast into a passive state of decay is now re-signified as an apocalyptic forewarning of nature's ability to overwhelm the fragile edifice of human civilization. Moreover, the reaccentuation of Greco-Roman ruins accomplished by this dialogical move even casts Duncanson's Italianate landscapes, such as ruins of Carthage, into an altered light. An iconographic element that repeatedly returns is the withered tree in the left side foreground. Just to go back, we saw that in Landscape with Dead Forest, sorry, Western Forest. Uh, so we have this iconographic element of the withered tree that repeatedly returns. And while that was fully present in Time's Temple, where it faces the ruins of a Greek temple, in Pompeii of 1855, the romantic symbol of the broken column, which connotes the brevity of life, 
becomes a substitute for the tree that has been stripped of leaves and hence vitality. And this cru in this crucial transposition between nature and culture, I think we find the hermeneutic key to Duncanson's handling of the sublime. The triumphalist vision of the American sublime that had been voiced by uh, Durand and Church had converted the power of nature into a spectacle that placed the viewer in a position of mastery, whereas in Duncanson's landscapes, the awe-inspiring power of nature is now a destructive force that threatens the fragile world of culture with fires and tornadoes. In redoubling this dialogic transposition such that nature's threat to culture is now the imminent threat of a civil war that is about to destroy the nation's future, Lotus Eaters encodes a prophetic forecast in which the national doctrine of manifest destiny uh, is seen to lead only towards devastation and ruin. Were we to superimpose the overall formal structure of Lotus Eaters, I'll just go back to it, to superimpose the overall formal structure of Lotus Eaters onto that of Pompeii, which depicts the ruins that survived ancient Rome as a slave-owning society, long since destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. We see that Ulysses and his army occupy a center-left position that coincides exactly with the two minuscule figures whoops, who are pointing to cryptic signage on a stone tablet in the center-left foreground after the manner of Poussin's et in Arcadia ego. But where the dominant Western tradition evoked Arcadia as a prelapsarian past that could never be fully regained or made present again, that is to say an unrepresentable loss that for Poussin lies hidden and buried in a tomb. In Duncanson's allegorical prophecy of a dystopian future for a nation at war with itself, a diacritical move is performed that opens the Western landscape to an inaugural act of appropriation that produces a signifying difference that demands to be read diasporically. To state the case another way then, the Odyssey lends itself to diasporic reading as a tale of a war hero who cannot get home without overcoming the trials he encounters on the journey back. Put simply, whereas Ulysses left a scene of war behind him in his quest to return home to Greece, Duncanson paints a scene in his Cincinnati studio at a time when the Civil War is ahead of him, and in 1861, of course, no one could know how long it would last or what the scale of the devastation it would inflict, even as he embarks on a touring exhibition that takes him outside of the United States and far away from home. The timing of his tour between 1861 and 1867 was indeed an act of invasion, as I stated earlier. But far from renouncing his identity as a free-colored American in a quest to assimilate, Duncanson's journey through Canada and the United Kingdom gives clear-cut support to Paul Gilroy's account of the utopian and dystopian factors that motivated 19th century Atlantic crossings in terms of a dynamic of push and pull uh, factors among contradictory forces that were always held in mutual tension. Although the visual arts has received less attention than the political and literary forms of transnational circulation that arose in the space of the Black Atlantic, I want to suggest by way of concluding this reading that three key issues call for our concentrated attention in considering Duncanson's travels as part of the hermeneutic context in which Lotus Eaters produced its different layers of meaning. These issues concern the conditions of reception that were created by the touring exhibition as a mid-19th century medium for creating audiences in the public sphere. Secondly, acts of iconographic surrogation that touch upon the sublime as an aesthetic category for that which is unrepresentable. And then finally, the value of comparative readings across visual and literary texts to reveal common strategies of diasporic indirection. On the one hand, Duncanson produced numerous observational studies while he was resident in Montreal, and he continued to sketch extensively during his time in Ireland and Scotland, working up chosen scenes into fully realized landscapes once he returned to his studio. 
The atmospheric detail of the pastoral scene in view of the St. Anne's River, for example, produced in 1870, many years after his 1863 work on the St. Anne's River in Canada, is one such example. And while certain topographical studies were filtered through literary sources, and one of these would be the Falls of Minnehaha of 1862, which is based on Longfellow's poem, uh, The Song of Hiawatha of 1855, but which was sketched in Minnesota before he'd actually arrived in Canada. We find that on the other hand, Duncanson's approach to landscape was also highly synthetic in character, blending a range of elements into an artifice of allegorical signification, uh, in the case of lotus eaters and other landscapes that evoke a quasi-orientalist exoticism. Uh, and this foregrounds his imaginative powers of invention over his equally important skills of empirical observation. Hence, the exotic trope of the tropical palm seen in such early works as Mayan Ruins, Yucatan of 1848, and then much later in the Vale of Kashmir, uh, which was a topic that he returned to in 1867 and then 1871, is often seen as fanciful escapism. But where utopia literally means no such place, the exoticism is signaled by the palms, which featured in Lotus Eaters as well, does not suggest a direct reference to the lost African origin of the diaspora, even though palms carry such connotations in many 19th century European paintings, so much as it acts as an enigmatic signifier of an elsewhere or an other place that cannot be represented directly. Gilroy places strong emphasis on critical indirection in expressive forms of black music, most notably the spirituals. Where blacks were excluded a priori from the polity, he argues that, quote, the notion that a future society will be able to realize the social and political promise, um, sorry, let me start that. Where blacks were excluded a priori from the polity, he argues that, quote, the notion that a future society will be able to realize the social and political promise that present society has left unaccomplished gave rise to a politics of transfiguration in which utopian strivings were, quote, steeped in the idea of a revolutionary or eschatological apocalypse, the Jubilee. Insofar as, quote, the concept of Jubilee emerges in black Atlantic culture to mark a special break or rupture in the conception of time defined and enforced by the regimes that sanctioned bondage, end quote, there is a resonant echo, I think, between Gilroy's notion of what he calls the slave sublime, orientated around an eschatological conception of time, and the visual modes of indirection through which Lotus Eaters encoded its sublime allegory beneath an exotic non-place that is presented to the beholder on the otherworldly surface of its artifice. By taking some degree of control over its exhibitionary display, is there not also a sense, moreover, that while the artist may have employed the exotic in the Lotus Eaters so as to win over his European and Canadian audiences, the subtext itself may have been more readily intelligible to audiences outside the United States. Having received photographs of the painting that Duncanson had prepared in um, Montreal by William Notman, and informed by press reports that proclaimed, quote, this painting, we're going back to the Lotus Eaters, uh, just to make sure, this painting may rank among the most delicious that art has given us, but it is also wrought with the skill of a master in all, even the minutest of details, end quote. Tennyson then invited the artist to visit him on the Isle of Wight. Greeting him as, quote, one of my Canadian kinsmen, end quote, for Duncanson had entered Dublin on a Canadian passport, the poet said, come, uh, poet said, quote, come whence it may, your landscape is delightful, and though not quite my lotus land, is a land in which one loves to wander and linger, end quote. But in point of fact, lotus eaters had already been viewed in English and Scottish anti-slavery circles by way of a small book that contained a lithographic reproduction. This was Testimonies Concerning Slavery, published in 1864, by the Reverend Moncure Conway, who was a US slave owner turned abolitionist and also the editor of the Cincinnati Dial. 
In a November 1865 article, Conway reported to his American readers that Duncanson, quote, has been invited to come to London by the Duchess of Sutherland and the Duchess of Essex, who will be his patrons, end quote. And referring to the meeting of artist and poet, he actually sounded a note of surprise at the apparent incongruity of the scene. Quote, think of a Negro sitting at the table with Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Tennyson, Lord and Lady of the Manor, and Mirror of Aristocracy, and so forth, end quote. But what I think is most revealing about the transatlantic context of Conway's report is not the encounter between the African-American artist and the English aristocracy that was signaled by race, so much as the difference in attitude that distinguished British and American viewpoints on the basis of nationality. The Civil War had provoked fervent anti-slavery support among sections of the British upper classes. And in this respect, the supportive patronage that Duncanson received was fully of a piece with the acclaimed tours of the United Kingdom that, had been, that were undertaken by the Fisk University Jubilee Singers much later in 1871 and 73 under the patronage of the Earl of Shaftesbury. The British aristocracy's anti-slavery politics may well have been informed by their superior self-image as America's former colonial masters. But even as he expressed a white American Midwesterner's disbelief at the meeting of a free colored artist and the poet laureate of Victorian England, Conway intuited a signifying link between the slave sublime voiced by the Fisk Jubilee Choir and the allegorical subtext buried beneath the surface of Duncanson's Lotus Eaters. Having met the artist himself while visiting the South Kensington Museums, which is today the Victoria and Albany Museum, it strikes me as highly significant that the concept of the sublime returns sotto voce in the text of Conway's 1864 book, Testimonies, where, in an almost reverential tone that contrasts markedly with his more journalistic voice, he insightfully wrote, quote, <laughs> My belief is that there is a vast deal of high art yet to come from that people in America. Their songs and hymns are the only original melodies we have. And one of the finest paintings which I've ever seen is a conception of Tennyson's Lotus Eaters, painted by a Negro, end quote. Duncanson's tour was self-financing. In the course of exhibiting Western Tornado and Lotus Eaters, he produced copies of these two works along, on a much smaller scale along the way, as well as exhibiting and also selling new works. Now, one contemporary precedent for such a tour was that undertaken by Frederick Church, who organized a highly successful touring exhibition within the United States of Heart of Andes. These are two installation views where its public presentation was dramatically staged by the theatrical use of framing and elaborate drapery. And just to make the point about um, landscape and national identity in the context of Manifest De Destiny, we have portraits of three American presidents as part of the uh, framing apparatus. But also, another precedent can be found some six years previously. That's to say, another precedent for the tour when Duncanson had partnered with the photographer John Presley Ball to exhibit their 600-yard landscape panorama that traveled to cities across the Midwest. And this was their splendid mammoth pictorial tour of the United States in 1855. <coughs> Featuring scenes of historical significance to the abolitionist movement, the tour also included anti-slavery pamphlets that had been prepared by Ball and was advertised in the abolitionist journalist journal, sorry, The Liberator. So in considering these two precedents for Duncanson's Black Atlantic journey, in terms of the touring exhibition as a medium for creating a public, it strikes me that his quest for artistic autonomy took precedence over the mere desire for international acclaim. By controlling the circumstances in which his pictures were exhibited and viewed by the public at large, Duncanson modified his relationship with white abolitionist patrons. In his journey from the US to the UK, it was not just perceptions of race that changed, but social relations of class. 
As a result of the aristocratic contacts he made during his tour of Britain, Western Tornado was purchased by the American actress Charlotte Cushman as a gift for the Duchess of Sutherland, who was mistress of the robes to Queen Victoria. And the land of the Lotus Eaters was purchased by the King of Sweden in 1905. And Stockholm is where the original painting resides to this day. Now that's what I call diaspora. In view of this diasporic journey on the part of artist and art object alike, it would be fitting to ask how Duncanson ultimately saw himself in terms of race and ethnicity. Having returned to Cincinnati after the end of the Civil War, where his place in the Midwest art establishment was secured and where his family all lived, uh, the primary fasche evidence for his self-perception lies in an 1871 letter in which Duncanson replied to his son, Reuben, who had made the accusation that he was, quote, passing for white. It reveals the artist's mixed feelings about race, because on the one hand, <coughs> he protested, quote, mark what I say here in black and white, I have no color on the brain, all I have on the brain is paint, end quote. And yet on the other, Duncanson stridently proclaimed, quote, my heart has always been with the downtrodden race, end quote. In his avowal of uh, his identity and allegiances, we may evaluate the subtextual and contextual indirection of double coding in Lotus Eaters then as the deliberative product of artistic intention and hence one of the foundational works with which African American art is inaugurated. Whereas Church also took flight from the Civil War, and he traveled to Jamaica for the duration. I think it's revealing that in his 1865 portrayal of the Caribbean landscape, uh, he also does not feature a single figure, even though this is a work that was produced in the same time and place as the Black Slave Rebellion in Jamaica of Morant Bay. So if one artist's freedom of choice could be said to cover over the political circumstances of its construction, we might say that Duncanson's relative unfreedom resulted in a work that ingeniously commented upon both its own conditions of production as well as its transnational reception context. Okay, and then finally, some comments on Afro-Atlantic hermeneutics. Throughout this interpretation, I've been at pains to step aside from those forms of biological, sorry, biographical reductionism that result in psychological projection. For me, the tempestuous landscapes that Duncanson painted towards the end of his life call out to be read as later explorations of the sublime rather than as an expression of inner conflicts that were caused by the debilitating mental illness that led to his death three months after his admission to the Michigan State Retreat Sanatorium in 1872. Without understanding a li an artist's life story, it is, of course, impossible to fully understand the art. But conversely, when biography becomes methodologically determinant, it actually obscures the ingenuity of the formal, stylistic, and iconographic choices whereby a single picture makes a difference precisely on account of the semiotic surplus that it is generated by ambiguity and doubleness. Now, although I focused on the palm tree rather than the figures in the Lotus Eaters under the heading of the exotic, it may be said that the allegorical subtext gains additional force once we read the ethnic ambiguity of the dark-skinned lotus bearers, bearers as a deliberate artistic choice. Yes, the figures signify blackness at the level of color, if not phenotype. But if we also interpret them as Native Americans bringing tobacco to Ulysses and his army, we unravel another layer of meanings. The Caucasian figures are European colonists who cannot go back to the old world as it is, for they have been seduced and abandoned by the new world landscape that acts as a signifier for the Americas in the hemispheric sense. On this understanding of ambiguity, reading the dark figures as both African American and Native American allows us to understand how the unrepresentable African origin of the black diaspora in the Americas entails what Joseph Roach in his uh, 1997 book, Cities of the Dead, refers to as symbolic acts of surrogation. 
If the lost Arcadian past is signified by indirection in one visual direction uh, by means of a grave or a tomb, Afro-Atlantic uh, varieties of indirection can be seen to subvert contextual limits on representations of blackness in the Civil War period by producing a situated ambiguity in which, to quote Roach, survivors attempt to fit satisfactory alternates into the cavities created by loss through death or other forms of departure, end quote. So one final instance in which Duncanson adds a further layer to our grasp of indirection and double coding lies in Ellen's Isle, Loch Katrine of 1870, which was worked up from sketches he made whilst on tour in Scotland. Bearing reference to Ellen Douglas, the female protagonist of Sir Walter Scott's epic poem, The Lady of the Lake, the painting actually depicts the topography of the island that Scott's poem alludes to, for it was part of the Highland estate that was owned by the Duchess, who was herself an abolitionist, where Duncanson had stayed in 1865. Learning that one of her previous guests was Boston Senator Charles Sumner, an advocate for full voting rights for African Americans after emancipation, Duncanson decided to make a gift of the painting upon his return to the United States. Sumner initially declined on the grounds that a legislator could not accept gifts, but he later accepted Ellen's Isle and hung it in his home before bequeathing it to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. <coughs> Observing, quote, the imagery of boats crossing the water in a tranquil landscape, <coughs> excuse me, Joseph Kettner argues that this, quote, represented the passage to freedom over the River Jordan to heaven, referred to in slave songs, end quote. But if such a reading perhaps tends to force its way through the picture plane as though to finalize one definitive meaning, the Black Atlantic perspective that I've tried to lay out offers a wider canvas in which to recognize the far-reaching differences made by small acts of dialogic differentiation. As Gilroy notes, Frederick Douglass, quote, acquired his new post-slave surname from the pages of Sir Walter Scott's The Lady of the Lake, end quote. Sharing the same textual source as Duncanson, the double S that Douglass chose in the spelling of his name was itself a signifying difference. Openly resisting interpretation as an act of assimilation, this foundational act of self-naming spoke to new practices of freedom in which the struggle for self-representation was central. So across literary and visual text then, such doubleness articulated one of the ways in which diaspora consciousness made its presence felt within the prevailing codes of Western culture. Thank you. I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks very much for your lecture. I'm so glad to I'm interested first of all, thank you, Michaela. I'm interested first of all in the um the the landscape of the Barrett Bay, the, the St. Thomas painting for ah. eighteen sixty five. So who is church and is it and and were people interested in the landscape of St. Thomas because of 1865? Had it, had 1865 as as we know it now happened yet when this was when this was? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Frederick Church was a white American landscape painter and arguably the chief exponent of what's be what became known as the American Sublime. His colleague, also another white American uh, Northerner, was um, Asher Durand. And Durand really formulated the intellectual aspirations of the American sublime, not simply producing a kind of faithful representation of the landscape, uh, but imbuing it with um, intellectual dignity, with nobility, with gravitas. And this was all subtended by the notion of manifest destiny. This was a nationalistic or patriotic ownership of the American wilderness, something that was specifically American. It wasn't Italian. It wasn't French. It wasn't of the old world. So um, that's really part of Frederick Church's background. 
Uh, but the juxtaposition, the contrast that I was making was that um, Church, who was known to be an abolitionist supporter, um, he you know, aligned himself with the abolition um, of slavery and with the politics of emancipation, also migrated outside US borders during the Civil War. He took his family to um, St. Thomas Parish in Jamaica um, for the duration, and then after the Civil War subsided, returned. But the contrast that I'm making here is that while we have a sublime rendition of the Caribbean landscape, which has no human figures in it, is there a sense in which it's covering over the political circumstances in which it was produced? Whereas Douglas, on the other hand, sorry, Douglas, whereas um, Duncanson, <laughs> on the other hand, is producing this highly elaborate, very synthetic landscape uh, that is clearly indicating by its literary source that this is not observational realism. But he's, pro he's producing for us a version of the sublime that I'm suggesting is inflected by um, um, you know, Paul Gilroy's thoughts about what's unrepresentable, um, as well as acknowledging the conditions of its own production and reception. Um. One would have to wait to engage the written version <laughs> of this, because it's so, so rich, uh, but so provocative in the good sense. So <laughs> I'm just, uh, I want to take you up on a couple of questions which I find that the case is being made, but not yet made, kind of. One is, am I, you, it doesn't seem to me uh, am I wrong to say that you are counterposing the existing readings of, of uh, this trio of artists uh, in terms of a biographical you know, um, uh, determinism, biographical determinism which reduces their work a lot to your reading which teases out elaborate allegorial allegorization I, it seems to me that you, it, it's not a case of either one or the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it seems to me that your, your lecture is predicated on that. It seems to me that even as you read, <coughs> as you gave your lecture, emphasizing one particular, I could still re see you know, elements of, of, you know, of the, uh, you know, of the, um, the, um, the, the uh, absence of content as leading to all kinds of the regions which you disapprove of. So, so I, I don't think that the case is made strongly enough for you know, um, uh, um, uh, privileging one region over the other. And so that's one. But the more substantial theoretical question is that of the category of the sublime. The, the, the unrepresentability of in the sublime at, attains to every possible subject. You know, not just the uh, you no know, the slave slave sublime. It, it's also you know uh, whiteness. You know, so in that respect, it seems to me that all of the readings attached to the sublime as indicate indicative of a very subliminal, very indirect, very uh, elliptical allegorization of the black could also ap apply. You know, in, in precisely to the extent that one fastens one's readings on the sublime because unrepresentability is not limited to racial categories of one or the other. So it seems to me that that has to be looked at more you know, carefully mm. than, than, than we've been. But, but as I said, I mean, I wait for the written version of this too because it's uh, such a richness of you know, very provocative ideas. And, mm. and I, I wonder where you know, you'll take this in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thanks. Well, two, two points come to mind immediately um, in the context of your question. One, thinking about um, how Duncanson handles the sublime across all of his works. Let's remember, first, first of all, that he was self-taught, um, that he hadn't had access to formal education. I mentioned the importance of abolitionist patrons, not simply in enabling his career, uh, and, you know, by his 40s, he'd become fairly well secure in the Cincinnati art establishment. Uh, but Rust, who was at Wilberforce, 
that portrait includes a number of literary works, uh, and you can read the spines in the background, and Homer's Odyssey is one of them. I think they were important encouragers of his ambition. And by all accounts, he was um, a very restive personality, really striving for something um, that was extraordinary. You know, that he wasn't simply seeking to uh, join the club to assimilate or to conform. When he s talked about wanting to produce a great picture, I think the imaginative depth of his ambition needs to be taken into account. So against that background um, and thinking of the sublime, you're absolutely right that differences of race alongside other differences are all made relative in relation to uh, an experience that is, strictly speaking, unrepresentable. But I don't think, um, as an artist, Duncanson was necessarily pitching himself at that level. We're talking about somebody who probably hadn't read Kant on the sublime or Edmund Burke. Uh, whereas I think that the um, case of the, the way in which the sublime is handled by Church and Durand sits very comfortably within a European-centered philosophical tradition in which those links could be made. So I, I fully accept your point. Um, and all I'm adding to it is, um, I suppose, a degree of gradation in terms of how we might think of uh, the indirection featured in that work um, as lending itself to Gil Gilroy's notion of the slave sublime, for example. The, um, w was he passing for white? <laughs> what was the context in which... Uh, within which his son was writing to his father, accusing him of passing for white, A. The answer you read said, suggested he was passing for white. And I'm, I'm just curious about that. And also, what was the site for uh, the only, Nig uh, the only America, original American music was um, uh, the, the Negro Melodies? That was, what's that, uh, um, the mm -hmm. collection called 1864? That was by Reverend Moncure Conway who was this former slave owner turned abolitionist editor of the Cincinnati Dial. And for me, that was really important in terms of this intuitive connection between um, the expressive indirection in its musical form, the spirituals, these original melodies specific to America, and the element of indirection or allegory at work in the subtext in the visual medium which very few art historians, apart from Sharon uh, Patton, have really focused on. Uh, and to, to date, Joseph Kettner's study is the most thorough, the most exhaustive. I think the context, as I understand it, for his son's um, letter in 1871, which was a year before his admission to the sanatorium and his death, to put it very bluntly, was anxiety about legacy and what you know, he would be left in, in, in terms of uh, the not inconsiderable wealth that Duncanson had accumulated as a professional artist. Um, so this is a way of endearing your father to you by saying that you're the right to your father? <laughs> quite, quite. Uh, but I suppose in such extreme moments, the truth will out. <laughs> Did his son get his money? Uh, that I don't know in terms of the final distribution of the, of the estate. But the family was very important in terms of his loyalties to it. Um, Ketno asked the question, why did he come back? Um, he spent two years in Canada. He was in um, Dublin. He was in Edinburgh. He was fated by the London Art Establishment. And if the only motivation was professional advancement, international acclaim, that would be a valid question. I think it's only, it's, but it's, it's one dimension. It's not every dimension. I think his attachments to his family but also to place are, in, are important in, in terms of understanding this circular journey. It wasn't just a one-way travel from the US to Britain. It was like a sojourn, a tour that came, came back round. And you're familiar, of course, with the Borgia statement in 1895 about the originality of Plato and his descendants. It's exactly the same uh, as, as Collins did. Oh, right, yeah. right. So he you know, ought to be recited today. Oh, thank you, yeah. Quite
it's a terrific lecture. Um, but uh, I, my memory is that he claimed to be of Scottish ancestry, didn't he? Or he, I mean, his name would suggest that as well. Um, and it, it seems to me that remark of Stitt's <coughs> answering the very advanced question, um, his identity, that presumably at some point he must have proclaimed that he was, you know, certainly of, if not half Scottish, but at least of quite a lot of Scottish mm. blood. Mm. expressing that, but surely he also must have felt that this was uh, also a part of his identity. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to the question of biography and how much store we want to set by that in terms of how it influences our interpretation and understanding of the work. I took my cue from Kettner's research of the early 1990s, um, which I'm covered evidence that questioned the earlier understanding of Scottish um, ancestry, uh, which would have been on his mother's side. Um, and so I've really put that to one side in terms of that broader impetus to argue that we fully need to take stock of the relevant aspects of biography without seeing that as being the kind of um, hermeneutic determinant, therefore this is what it means. Um, so I think the um, um, revision in the scholarship um, with regards to his, um, his ancestry has placed a question mark over um, not only the Scottish parentage, but also his relationship to Canada, because previous studies suggested that he was um, educated in Canada, uh, whereas our understanding in view of Kettner's research is that the family apprenticeship in Mount Healthy in Cincinnati, Ohio, was the formative factor in terms of his entry into, uh, into the arts. Um, there was another aspect that you mentioned that I think I'm in danger of losing. Um, maybe it'll come back, sorry. Yes, but I think the interesting thing about the journey um, and to think of it as a diasporic journey is to think about its somewhat erratic character. Th this is not an imperialist adventure in which you know, someone is going to Mount Everest because it's there. It's not a journey that's dictated by ambition, uh, sorry, intention in the sense that um, I know in previous presentations I was asked whether he traveled to Europe to find out particular lithographers to illustrate his work. I think the journey is shaped by opportunities that are encountered along the way. And I think the support of abolitionists, such as the Duchess of Argyle, who offered him, you know, um, he stayed, whose residence he stayed at during his time in Scotland, were as important as his own uh, driving ambitions and intentions for the journey. Yeah, could you uh, tell me again the uh, countries he painted in outside the U.S.? Scotland was one. Yeah, the first was in um, Ireland. In Ireland. He mm -hmm. exhibited in Dublin and, and also uh, produced observational sketches. Then it was Scotland. How long did he uh, did he paint in those countries? Uh, these would have been periods of, of six months or less in each before staying in London for a year. I see. Now this <coughs> idea of the structural understanding of context or agency within context, would that help to shed, when you look at it that way, would that help to shed any light on uh, differences, subtle differences in his paintings within and outside the, uni the United States? Um. I think it would contribute to it. Whether or not it would be decisive, I think, is a different matter. 
Um, even though they weren't illustrated, uh, these later seascapes are near at hand. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has Dog's Head Scotland, which was based on a sketch that he produced during his time in Scotland, but then completed after he got back to Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and these have been predominantly read in biographical and psychological terms as expressing the inner turmoil of his conflicts of his, of his psyche, whereas I tend to see them as further meditations, if you like, further reflections on the sublime, on the power of nature as this potentially devastating cataclysmic force, as something that has the power to overwhelm clear-cut boundaries. Um, so th there, would, there is a difference um, in terms of these seascapes that he produced in Scotland and Ireland in the latter three years of his life, and the pastoral, picturesque, and even Italianate framework with which he produced his studies of American scenery. Um, but perhaps another way of, of making that contrast or of re revealing what's specific to Duncanson's approach would be to compare it to contrast it to the work of Edward Mitchell Bannister, an African-American landscape um, painter who was also active in the 1860s, who didn't travel abroad, but who produced extensively uh, seascapes based on the New England coast. And there we have a tension between the kind of diasporic dimension that I'm arguing for in relation to Duncanson's travels outside the US. And um, an African-American landscape painter uh, based in Boston, based in New England, who produces seascapes, but I would be a lot more hesitant about framing Bannister as a Black Atlantic artist. Hi. Um, I think you did a really fascinating job sort of contrasting Duncanson's work with the American tradition of the American sublime with like the Hudson River Valley School and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm wondering if to what extent his work was influenced also by his reception in Europe. Um, because it, um, as we've already sort of talked about a little bit, there is a sort of separate European tradition of the sublime. Um, and you spoke about how, you know, he probably didn't have access, say, to Kant or something like that. But it seems like the people that he was interacting with in England or, um, say, was it the King of Sweden who purchased his, um, one of his paintings? I wonder to what extent that sort of European version of the sublime influenced his reception and to what extent <coughs> that reception influenced his later work. Mm. And also um, sort of what potential links there might be between the European version, um, so, sort of the, the Germanic sublime, um, the relationship between that and, and nationalism and sort of a European context. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think all of those very important questions. Um, I think there's a very interesting relationship between the moment in which he conceives the intentions for the Lotus Eaters. He's in Cincinnati, he's in Ohio, as the, the Civil War is imminent, it's, it's about to happen. And it's always struck me, even though I don't have evidence to support any direct connection, that there might be a possible link between the Brigadier General um, uh, at this time, the Brigadier General of Volunteers that had been appointed by Lincoln, which was Ulysses Grant, and the intertextual source uh, in Homer. I don't know whether there's an element of punning involved there in terms of giving the audience a cue as to this subtext that's buried beneath this apparently tr tranquil scene. So I'll simply leave that open as a, as a sort of question. Um, <coughs> sorry, I've forgotten the second part of your, your question oh, there. No, I just wondered to what extent you're interested in sort of, since you're thinking of him as a sort of di diasporic artist, um, to what extent you're interested in what the sublime meant sort of at that time in the European context that he was traveling in? Right. Certainly. I think that um, there, there would have been an impetus to exhibit the work amongst audiences which, in his view, may have been more receptive to this subtext. 
for whom the subtext may have been more apparent. Um, so, as it were, a kind of a, ne a, a kind of relay of um, of indirection, uh, and I, I think that was certainly an important part of the um, the impetus for the tour. Hmm. Thank you.